Well, last week we saw that after the uh, physical restoration, the process of spiritual restoration had begun, long years in exile and absence of uh, a famine of God's word, the people gathered. They were so excited that for six hours from the beginning of day until midday, they heard the word read and explain. Uh, their incredible reverence meant that they stood during that time, but more importantly, it was not the outward reverence, but the reverence of the heart, uh, the desire to, uh, to obey wholeheartedly. Why? Because the word was a very precious and rare commodity in their day. It wasn't as prevalent uh, as it is today, and probably that's why we struggle, because it's so plentiful in our day, we often take it for granted. Well, the desire for the word and their heart to obey brought a renewal and awakening. That's what we began to see last year in, in chapter 8, an awakening that was occurring. And we're going to pick up today in the middle of that. In chapter 9 and 10, we're going to see the course that this awakening took and the process and steps of their renewed relation with God. While you're turning to uh, Nehemiah chapter 9, I, I always like to keep you abreast of the latest theological developments. And I just heard of one this week. Uh, theologians who have been studying 1 Samuel 18. If, if you don't know the passage, that's where David was playing uh, his harp for Saul. David was a phenomenal musician, and Saul became very troubled in the spirit and angry, and he threw his spear and tried to pin David to the wall. Well, theologians have always wondered what exactly was happening there, and they've just uncovered this week some new truth that I thought you'd be uh, interested in knowing. Evidently, the reason that Saul was so vexed in his spirit and wanted to kill David was that David was playing Christmas music before Thanksgiving had even happened. <laughs> I had you, didn't I? That's not funny. A lot of theologians spend a lot of time figuring that out. All right. <laughs> yeah, where do you go from there, right? <laughs> All right, you see the last verse that we covered last week in chapter 8, verse 18. It tells us that Ezra read from the book of the law day after day. They're celebrating the Feast of Booths or Feast of Tabernacles for seven days. He read the law every day. And it says in 818, and on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. Now, there were regular solemn assemblies among God's people at, at Passover. Here, uh, after the Feast of Booths, there were also special ones, like when Solomon's temple was dedicated or when there were times of crisis, um, they would call for a, a solemn assembly. And very simply, that was just a, a very holy occasion where the people, the community of Israel, God's people, came together and, and they were uh, sanctified. They had set themselves apart. They had typically gone through some kind of purification ritual and were very set apart from the world, from the things around them as they came before the Lord. Now, I will mention to you, because you'll notice this on some occasions in the Old Testament, where there were solemn assemblies and God condemned them. In fact, he said they were detestable to him. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 13 and 14, Isaiah records this from word from the Lord, your festivals I hate with all my being, they have become a burden to me, I am weary of bearing them. Why? Well, the same thing God would say to us today about our worship, it's a reminder that God is not pleased with our outward displays of worship if inwardly we're living in rebellion. God's not pleased with our shows of, of righteousness when we're truly not living up to his standard of righteousness. And there were many times throughout the Old Testament when the people were in rebellion against God and they would have these big gatherings, these solemn assemblies. They would celebrate the festivals that God had told them to celebrate. And God said, that ain't working. I know what your heart looks like. And it's a warning to us today when we gather for worship to make sure that inwardly we are obeying and honoring the Lord. So a solemn assembly, it's a time of, of uh, soul searching, a time of self-examination. A part of solemn assembly would include a time of confession, uh, a time of repentance, uh, even a time of fasting because of their seriousness before the Lord. So this is where we find the Israelites going into chapter 9. Um, you saw last week in chapter 8 they made a very godly a wholehearted response to the word, and now they're very anxious um, to be to have their relation with God renewed. So, chapter nine. Let's look first at the first five verses in chapter nine. Now, on the twenty-fourth day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. 
And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. Now, that's not a quarter of 24 hours. It's not six hours. It's a quarter of the day, which for them was 12 hours, 12 hour day, 12 hour night. So for three hours, they read from the book of the law. For another quarter of the day, another three hours, they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God. On the stairs of the Levites stood Yeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shvaya, Buni, Shirebiah, Bani, and Kunoni. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Yeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabneah, Sherebiah, Hodia, Shvanya, and Tetabia said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. So they heard the, the, the word. That's what we saw last week in chapter 8. That naturally led to a desire for and a time set aside to worship. And what you see in verses 1 through 5 that we just read is a really good pattern for worship. The elements that you see there are hearing Scripture, uh, praising God, prayer, confession of sin, and then sanctification or setting ourselves, setting themselves apart from the people of the world, from the foreigners, for us setting ourselves apart from what displeases God. And what you see in verses 1 through 3, if you remember in chapter 8, Nehemiah and the leaders told them that they should be feasting and celebrating. Here they've gone from feasting to fasting. Why? Because the word brought conviction. And that's the appropriate response when we're confronted with sin. Three hours they spent listening to the word and then three hours in prayer and confession. Now that, that's unusual to us in our day, but that shouldn't be that unusual when God really gets a hold of people. That they would have a deep hunger and desire for the word and a deep hunger and desire to bring themselves in right relationship with the Lord. The Day of Atonement had already happened. That happened before the, uh, the Feast of Booths, but they knew that it would take more than one confession a year. They knew that it was important that they needed constant cleansing, constant forgiveness, constant renewal from the Lord. It wasn't a one-shot deal. And I think for us, it's recognizing that confession of sin and acknowledgement of being a sinner, that's the thing that starts your relationship with God. You have to come to the point of recognizing you're a sinner separated from God because of your sin, and you have to be willing to admit that and receive the forgiveness of Christ. So confession of sin and repentance starts your relationship with God, but I would say to you that confession of sin and repentance also sustains your relationship with God. You didn't quit sinning when you came to Christ. That wasn't the end of it. You still fall short. What's different is Christ has already paid for your sin, but you still have to confess and you still have to repent. In Psalm 66, 18, the psalmist said, if I regard iniquity, if I hold on to sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Does that mean that I'm no longer his child? No. You don't lose your salvation every time you sin, but what it does mean is your fellowship is broken. And so just as confession starts your relationship with the Lord, confession also sustains your relationship. You've got to keep what I would say, you've got to keep short accounts with God. Don't let it pile up. Listen, if you're a child of God, the minute you sin, the Holy Spirit of God who indwells you convicts you of that sin. At that moment, you've got a choice. You either hear him and you respond to him and you confess and you repent or you ignore him, you tune him out, you say not now, maybe later. And pretty soon, it gets more and more difficult for you to hear the Spirit of God convicting you of sin. It's important that we keep short accounts with God that we respond to conviction immediately. Verse 2 says that they, they separated themselves from all foreigners. That, that's any of the people living in the land who weren't part of God's chosen people. They separated themselves. Now, you remember that Israel had issues throughout the Old Testament of intermarrying and getting involved with the pagan peoples in the land, and every time it led them away from their devotion to the Lord. He's not saying here, and I'm not saying here, that as believers today we should never associate with non-believers. That's ridiculous. We're called to be around non-believers. We're called to help them come to faith in Christ. We just have to be careful of the nature of our relationships and the level of involvement. A ship is safe in the water as long as the water is not in the ship. We're not intended as believers to be in dry dock. We're intended to be out there and to be in the water. We just have to be careful not to let the water invade or get into us. 
What he's saying here when he talks about the people separating themselves from all the foreigners, you can't say you're devoted to the Lord if you aren't separated from the world. You can't be devoted to two things. And their devotion was to be the Lord. God had told them repeatedly, repeatedly that they were to be holy. What does that mean? Set apart for him. First Peter, chapter, we've been given the same command. First Peter chapter 1, verse 15. But just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy for I am holy. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness in his wonderful light. You can't declare the praises of him if you're still walking in darkness. Holy means being set apart, being different, being in the light, walking in the light. And as you do that, you're able to declare the praises of God to a dark world. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the desire to have, the lust of the eyes, the, the desire to, uh, to, to do, the pride of life, the desire to be, all those things are not from the Father but from the world, and the world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. Clearly, we're called to be separated just as they were. So look in verses 1 through 5. Here's what happen, what's happened. They've heard the word. Um, they've prayed. And there's more prayer coming here in chapter 9. They've confessed. They've sanctified or set themselves apart. And then one other element in worship in this text of these five elements is that they were to praise God. Verse 5. Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Listen. It is vital in our worship for certain here when we're gathered corporately, but even individually as you worship each day of your life, that's what life with the Lord and relationship with him is about. It's vital that we bless the Lord, that we exalt his name. That's a command for his children. God has commanded, if you're his child, that you bless him and that you praise him. You, you know how this thing of worship works when we're gathered here together? God speaks to us through his word. This is what he uses to speak to us. Now, it may be directly from here as we're looking into the word together. It may be in your Sunday school class. It may be in a scripture song that we sing. But God speaks to us from his word. And then we speak to him through what? Through our prayer and through our praise. That's us talking to God. When we're singing these songs that we sing on Sunday morning, it's not about us. It's not about entertainment. It's not about our favorite song. It's about what we're saying to God. Can I tell you this morning, and, and some of you are not going to like me saying this, and I'm not thinking of any certain individual people, but singing is the easiest way to praise God. These Levites that are here, the Levites that, that we read last week, you know, the role of the Levites, some of the Levites, some of that tribe, that clan were priests. Not all Levites were priests. The other Levites served in various ways in the temple. And one of the ways they served is these Levites were men who sang. That's kind of an oxymoron in our day, isn't it? The Levites were men who sang. There's something about words that are set to music that, that focuses us and touches our soul. Now, let me say to you, and again, I'm not, well, I don't want to look at anybody. Okay? I don't want to look at anybody. If you're not going to sing, you need to be careful that you're maintaining your focus of worship when we're singing. If you're just going to do this, I hope at least you're contemplating and meditating on the words that you see and, and the words that you're hearing, and you're trying to worship inwardly, wholeheartedly. But I would also tell you, you might want to consider opportunities to praise the Lord outwardly. It might be a good idea if you think you're going to heaven that you get some practice in. <laughs> that was free, John. I wrote that part of the message, not John, okay? But I happen to love to worship. You know, you haven't asked me to sing in years. <laughs> I, my voice is hidden in a quartet. Come on, man. I think I'd rather be in the venue this morning. They're probably a lot nicer than you guys. Uh, where was I going? <laughs> 
All right, so they're given this command in verse 5 to praise God, and they do just that. The remainder of chapter 9 is a prayer primarily of praise. And you're going to see three things they focus on. First of all, very simply, the greatness of God. That's where you got to start. If you come to prayer time always singing about what you need and what you want God to do for you, your prayers will become very selfish. You start focusing on God's greatness. Then you're going to see they look at his goodness to them, his people, and then his grace. So let's read through it. We're going to move pretty quick through chapter 9, picking up in verse 6, God's greatness. You're the Lord, you alone. You're, you're the only true God. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth, and all that is in it, the seas, and all that is in them. God, you're the creator. No, one, no other God has been able to do what you've done. You preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. God, you're the sustainer. You not only created everything, but you sustain it. You know that, that Jesus said, not a sparrow falls without God knowing it? You know that Jesus said, God knows the numbers of hair on your head, and I won't make any cracks about some are easier to number than others. I'm not going there. But think about the number of people just in this room. And yet God knows of all creation the number of hairs on every head that he's made. He is a great God. Verse 7, they start looking at God's goodness. You're the Lord, the God who chose Abram, brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, gave him the name Abraham. Why did he choose Abram? Because Abram was just a phenomenal saint? No, not at this point. God just in his goodness chose Abram, changed his name to Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite. Why did God make that covenant? Because Abraham deserved it? No, just because he was a good God. And you have kept your promise for you are righteous. You know what we're going to see all through chapter 9? How many times they were unfaithful, and yet God was faithful because he's a good God. Verse 8, you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt. You heard their cry. You performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land, for you knew they had acted arrogantly against our fathers. And you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. You divided the sea before them so that they went through in the midst of the sea on dry land, and you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. Why? Because they deserve to be saved from Egypt? No. Why? Because they're great people? No. Why? Because God thought they were the only people who could bear his name? No. He just chose to be good and to be gracious to them. Verse 11. No, I did verse 11. Verse 12. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day, by a pillar of fire in the night, to light for them the way which they should go. Always with them always with them throughout that entire time, even after they rebelled. We're getting to that in a minute, and they had to spend 40 years wondering, always with them. Why? Because he's a good God. Verse 13, you came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. God didn't have to come down and speak. God didn't have to lower himself to speak. He didn't have to do that. And even the rules and laws were part of his goodness because he was helping them know how to live because you can't live life apart from God's rules and God's laws and ever have meaning and purpose and be successful. Uh, where are we? Verse 14. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by Moses your servant. This Verse 15. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger. You brought water out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in and possess the land that you had sworn to give them. Gracious, undeserved gifts. Man, if you and I were God, once they rebelled and did all that junk they did, would we have provided food? We'd say, no, you go out and find some desert rats if you can. Maybe you can eat that. We wouldn't have been worried about them, but God was gracious. He continued to provide for them. Verse 16. God did all that, but they and our fathers acted presumptuously. They stiffened their neck. They did not obey your commands. They refused to obey. They were not mindful of the wonders you performed among them, but they had stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to slavery in Egypt. What? After all God did, they still rebelled. They still disobeyed. They even got to a point where they said, forget this deal with Moses. Let's appoint a leader to take us back to Egypt after God had freed them and provided for them. But you're a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf, 
and said, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt and committed great blasphemies. What did God tell them about worshiping other gods? They totally rebelled. Even after they committed great blasphemies, verse 19, you in your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud led them in the way, did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way by which they should go. He continued to be with them. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold manna from their mouth. You gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. And can I remind you that even after that judgment, and they were forced to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, they still, they still had the gall to keep bickering and complaining and whining. Forty years, verse 21, you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Look at this. Did you, have you ever seen this before? Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. I started to say smell. I bet they did smell. <laughs> Wandering in the desert. Their clothes didn't wear out. You know, I got thinking, I'd, I'd read that before, but I hadn't really come to it. I got thinking this week, okay, they wandered for 40 years for that disobedient generation of adults to die off so that the children over those 40 years grew up, right? What did they wear? <laughs> I'll bet. Not only did their clothes not wear out, I bet as those kids grew, the clothes grew with them. I bet God miraculously did that. They didn't have any other clothes, right? You see what God did for them? It's incredible how good he was to them. Verse 22, you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them every corner. So they took possession of the land of Sihon, king of Heshbon, the land of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, just as he promised to do before all the disobedience. You multiplied them as the stars of heaven. You brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and possess. So the descendants went in and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land. But they didn't have to fight the battles. You know that. If you've read the Old Testament stories of them conquering the land, they didn't fight the battles. God fought for them. You subdued the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, gave them into their hand with their kings and peoples of the land that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities and a rich land. Look at this. They took possession of houses full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, wells already dug, vineyards, olive orchards, fruit trees in abundance. They didn't even, when they got in the land, have to figure out how to build the infrastructure and how to get housing. It was all provided for them. So they ate and they were filled. They became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient. They rebelled against you. They cast your law behind their back. They killed your prophets who warned them in order to turn them back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Over and over and over again, they saw God's goodness, and yet they still forgot God. What happened? They got in the land where everything was provided, and they no longer needed God. They forgot him. Therefore, listen, this is the goodness of God. You gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. That's a good thing. If God had not done that, they never would have turned back to him. In the time of their suffering, they cried out, you heard them from heaven, and according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors and saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before you. You abandoned them to the hand of their enemies, so they had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven, and many times you delivered them according to your mercies. You warned them to turn them back. They acted presumptuously, did not obey your commands. They sinned against your rules, which if a person does them, he shall live by them. But they turned a stubborn shoulder. They stiffened their neck and would not obey. Listen, if you don't see God's goodness through there, you don't see God anywhere. Over and over and over again, he was merciful to them and provided for them. And when they forgot him in his goodness, he handed them over to the enemies so that they would be turned back to him. And then the final part here of chapter 9, you see God's grace. We've seen it all through his goodness, but here it's very clear, his grace. Many years, verse 30, many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through the prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the people of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercies... <laughs> 
You did not make an end of them or forsake them for your gracious and merciful God. Wouldn't it have been a lot easier for him to just wipe them out and start over with a new people? He never gave up on them. Verse 32, now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardships seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria to this day. God, don't let this seem trifling. We, we understand we've, we've been through the hardship. We know we've messed up, and you've had to continually judge us. Verse 33, yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us. For you have dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. Our kings, our princes, our priests, our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them. Even in their own kingdom, amid your great goodness that you gave them, in the large rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Behold, we are slaves to this day in the land that you gave our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves. What do they mean we are slaves? They're back in the land. Well, they're still under the dominion of Persia. Its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. But do you hear throughout the, this, this prayer in chapter 9 that they recognize the greatness of God, they recognize the goodness of God, they, they recognize his incredible grace toward them? And, and verse 38, because they've seen all that and recited all that, look what they say in verse 38. Because of all this, your greatness, your goodness, your grace, because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing on the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. And you see beginning in chapter 10, 84 names, starting with Nehemiah, 84 names listed, and they, they put the covenant in writing in chapter 10, and they say, we're making this commitment to you. And in chapter 10, it says in verse 28 and 29, along with everyone else, it lists those names in the first 27 verses, along with all these names that are listed on this document, we're renewing our covenant. Now, let me tell you very quickly what's in the covenant. It's not really a new covenant. It's a covenant God had already made with them and they had broken. The covenant is this, verse 29, God, we're going to walk in your law and obey your commands. That's what they were supposed to be doing. Verse 30, we're not going to intermarry with pagan peoples in the land. Verse 31, we're going to observe the Sabbath. We're not going to buy and sell or do business with our neighbors on the Sabbath. We're going to observe the Sabbath, as you've told us to. Uh, verse 31 also, we're going to observe jubilee years. Every seventh year, debt was to be forgiven. Land was to be restored to the original owners. We're going to do what you've told us to do. Verses 32 through 39 they say, they, they commit to the Lord, we're going to take care of your house. What did that mean? Well, we're going to give to support it. We're going to provide wood. We're going to bring the first fruits of what? Of everything. That's what you see in 32 through 39. The first fruits of everything belong to the Lord um, because he was the one who provided for them. Verse 39 really sums it up. We will not neglect the house of the Lord. What you see in chapter 10 is after hearing the word, after a, a worshipful response, and after this prayer in chapter 9, the people were devoting themselves in a fresh and a new way to be committed to the Lord. They, they were repenting, they were returning to the covenant that he had made with them. It's a revival that's taking place in the land, a renewal, a, a, an awakening. You know, this week as I studied through and consider the whole picture of, of chapter 8 through 10 and, and thought about the application to us today, one thought trumped everything else. And it could be the title of what we just read in chapter 9, the kindness of God. You see that over and over and over through this prayer of history, basically, that, that God was incredibly kind. Why was it so important for them to remember the kindness of God. You know what? The kindness of God and, and his goodness to us is good motivation for us to obey and honor him. When we remember his kindness, we remember what he's done for us. When you look at the prayer of chapter 9, it, it makes it pretty clear the Israelites remembered God's goodness and grace toward them. That's what prompted their response in chapter 10. Now, I tell you, it's still true today. The Jewish people are much better at remembering what God has done than we are. Much, much better. 
it's important for us to be able to remember the kindness and goodness of God. We, we've got to keep a record of it. If you look in Joel, in the first chapter of Joel, Joel is reminding the people of all the incredible things that God is doing in their day, and he says to them, listen, do you see what God is doing? Tell it to your children. And your children should tell it to their children, and they should tell it to their children. What is he saying? It's important to remember how gracious and how good God is to us. And, and we've just seen why, but, but the psalmist refers to it also in the 106th Psalm. He says, when our fathers were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses, and they rebelled. We have to remember who our God is. We have to remember how gracious he is and how merciful he is and all the kindnesses that he's shown us. After the Israelites heard the book of the law in, in chapter 8, they remembered. They'd forgotten their history. They, they remembered. They knew now they had been disobedient when they heard God's law that had been given to them. And they wanted to renew their covenant with him when they realized that they'd been disobedient. Listen, I don't know about you, but you'd think if you were one of them, there'd be some fear in coming to God after being rebellious and disobedient. I mean, it's clear that God hates sin, that he judges and he, he, he punishes sin. But you have to balance that with God's desire to forgive. God doesn't want to have to judge and punish the whole purpose in God bringing conviction on us when we sin is to draw us to him. It's, it's his mercy that draws us to him. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Do you realize it is God's kindness that leads you to repentance? Listen, sin is, is certainly a serious thing to God. It, it costs the suffering and the death of his only son. But in his kindness, God made provision to cover and forgive our sin. In his kindness, God made us to be his own children. And in that, he has called us to live in a continual state of repentance, honoring and pleasing him. We've got to. To remember the kindness of God, that's what brings us to him. And we've got to remember as his children the kindness of God because that's what will help us be motivated and live lives that obey and honor him.